course you know me. I introduce myself. And this is how it goes is you introduce yourself to me as well. What is your name? That's how it works. You know, yeah, this is a mutual relationship. I'm about to preach. Spirit of God's going to do some work. You might as well just get excited and say hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? Amen. You agree? It's okay. It's relational. We're a community. I love that meet and greet time. It's so good. You know, as a church, we've been going through uh, Nehemiah, one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love that title, Rebuilding the Wall. There was a great task, a great project. The people had a mind to work. You guys saw that and the benefits of that last uh, yesterday as you did some stuff. But, man, you guys are doing some great work here. And uh, you can't come down from this wall, from this work. You got a mission. You got a purpose. You got a task. You may not even know that, but there is a great purpose and anointing on your life. And God wants to do great things through you. And so it's fun to be able to be serving God and, and studying his word and seeing how he's directing. And um, man, this, this series of Nehemiah has been so good. But what we're going to do today and next week is just, just push a little pause button. Because we're in this season called Easter. The resurrection, it is the Super Bowl because it is one of the key doctrines of our faith. Uh, and as you guys know, what's interesting is we're studying through Nehemiah here and the resurrection is all over. The first time you see life in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first time you see life like plants and animals and things was on the third day. If you start looking for it, the gospel in Jesus is everywhere, even in Nehemiah. And we just saw in Nehemiah chapter 8 two weeks ago, what were the Jewish people doing? The festival of booths. They were going and remembering what God had done. You see, the Jewish people, they marked their lives. God installed the law, and God wanted them to rest, to celebrate, to commemorate what he had done. And so God actually set up the calendar for them to take celebrations, pilgrimage, parties, and even days of rest to remember his goodness. And so they would rhythmically have these things over the years. And one of the biggest rhythms of their faith was the Passover, uh, this feast of booths where they would remember all that God had done, how they freed, their, uh, freed them from the people of Egypt to this promised land. And God just delivered them from slavery, go into the promised land. It was incredible. And this would mark their lives so much so they would remember. You see, in the same way, you and I as Christians... We celebrate Easter and in this Sunday as a time to commemorate and celebrate. On our calendar, we know a thing called Christmas. Well, what do we do? We celebrate that God became man and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, Jesus, formed and came down. And so in that season, what do we do in our calendar, our rhythm as Christians? We celebrate. We remember. You know, Paul, uh, Paul said, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel and preach to you what you received in which you stand. It is important as believers that you remember the faithfulness, the goodness, the importance of who God is and what he's doing. And so in this season, we want to pause because we want to remember. We want to praise God. This is a part of our calendar, right? Christmas, Easter. People are like, you only a Christmas and Easter Christian. Nah, bro, I'm a Christian all the day long, but it's going to be going down next week, isn't it? This is something that we can actually celebrate, remember, share the gospel, the good news. And it's not even just for a sense one day. This is a special week. This, this week in the traditional church calendar is called the Holy Week. Because there was a lot of things going on or the week of passion where Jesus had known what was going on. Uh, Thursday is actually something significant. It's Maundy Thursday where Jesus washed his disciples' feet knowing he was going to the Father. And in John chapter 13 through 17, you may want to read it this week, he instituted communion. He, he said, I've loved you till the end, but I don't abandon you. I'm going to leave my spirit. He's going to remind you and empower you and teach you. And he's, it's one of the richest texts that we have in Jesus of four chapters in John coming into this Passover, training his people, his disciples for this moment of Friday. And we call it Good Friday as Christians. It was where Jesus died for our sin. That same apostle that took communion with Jesus the day before, Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 24, he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that, that we might die to sin and live to righteous, for by his wounds we are healed. And for the Christian, you need to know this. This is a part of our celebration, the, the service, the humility, the washing and loving one another in community, the, the communion, the Friday, because without suffering, there is no glorification. The resurrection doesn't happen unless there's death. 
And so it comes to this climactic event on Easter where Jesus rose again, defeating sin, Satan, and death. And the Bible says that we have a living hope, a living hope. It's alive because Jesus not only died, but he rose again. And we trust that he is coming back again and giving us resurrected bodies. Amen. And so this is important to understand. And we kick off this season with today, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. I didn't grow up in Florida. I had no, no palm trees. I grew up in Washington State. Rainy. Don't miss it very much. But you may be familiar with this even in your church background of maybe even getting some palms and in Sunday school and hearing the story over and over again. But does, doesn't the Bible say to remember? And so we're going to remember in the significance of what that means. And, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. It's in all four Gospels. If you, if you need a Bible, just raise your hand. We have a Bible for you. And in, in these Bibles, uh, it's page 1053. And listen, if you don't own a Bible... Man, we would, we would uh, love to give this to you. Take this home. We want to be men and women of God's word, and that's why we take time to study God's word. I have my own Bible. I brought it, so I'm not going to steal from the church. I'm a pastor. I got a few. You know what I'm saying? So it's a little bit different. It'll be a sort of a, a topical message where we're going to subject and talk about this first beginning Holy Week, Palm Sunday. But wonderful truths, wonderful truths. It's Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And what we're going to do is we always do. We're going to read scripture. We're going to pray and ask the spirit of God to teach us. Amen. So let's read together. I'll have the slides on the screen. The slides are going to be in ESV. It's the Bible I use to preach. So I just have that there. But either way, you can read it on your tablet or on your phone. Shout out to all my techie people watching online. Chapter 19, verse 29 through 40 is the story that we're going to hone in on. It said, when he drew near to Bethage and Bethany, I just learned that was Mount of Fig. We know Bethany is Mount of Bread. These villages, Jesus drew near to them at the Mount called Olivet. He sent two of his disciples saying, go into the villages in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt. It's a donkey. It's tied. On which no one has ever sat. So it's a unique cold. Untie it and bring it in here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, a.k.a. stealing it, taking it away, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away. They obeyed. They found it just as he had told him. Verse 33 says, and as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, we had the prophetic message. Jesus knew what was up. Yo, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Yes, it wasn't a problem because when the Lord knows the problem, he has the answer. And there you go. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt. And they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the robe. And he was drawing near already on the way down to the Mount of Olives. And the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Verse 38 says, saying, blessed is the king. I just want to make a note. You're blessed if he is your king. Who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Let's take time to ask the Spirit of God to teach us. Spirit of God, Father God, Jesus, we thank you for being a triune God. In relationship, a God of love that wants to speak and has anointed your word. We know the means of your grace, God, and how you speak. I pray that you would speak to those that are here in this room and watching and even later. Holy Spirit, come. Anoint. Teach. Do what only you can do. Jesus, thank you that you're in our midst right now, delighting over us. 
And so we humbly come before you. You are our king. We have worshiped you in many ways through our giving, through our service, through praises. Lord God, we want to continue to worship you through the study of your word. We want to continue to give you our entire lives. And so we pray and we depend on you, Spirit of God, again, to point us to Jesus and Jesus be exalted. And as we do, draw men to yourself. It's in your name we pray. And everyone said, I'm calling this message, Jesus is God. And he wants you to know it. Jesus is God and he wants you to know it. This story that we read is in every single gospel. If you're a note taker, it's in Matthew chapter 21. It's in Mark chapter 11. It's in John chapter 12. And it's in Luke 19 of what we just read. It's when Jesus accepts worship as king. And this is so important. And this is what we want to remember on this Palm Sunday. It's a familiar story for some of us. And we maybe have heard of this before, but we know as we go to God's word and study through it that the spirit continues to pour into us and we abide in Christ going through his word and the spirit over and over and over again reveals truth that we need to be reminded of. And it shows us that Jesus is God. This is such an important reminder that we need in this Palm Sunday, but we need this every day. Not even just when our Sunday services are, when we get together in scripture, we, we, we need to be in the word and be reminded by the spirit of this every single day. And so the first thing I want you to see is just this, this text and the significance of it is how Jesus receives worship, honor, glory. People are, are crying out, they're worshiping, they're singing, they're, they're blessing the name of Jesus. And if you're a Bible student, you should Understand the significance because Jesus is fully God, but he is fully man. And in the time they would have known, especially the Jewish people, they would have had the Ten Commandments, the law of God. And in Exodus 20, verse 3, it says, you shall have no other gods besides me. They would have the prophet like Jeremiah 25, 6, who would say, do not all after go after these gods to serve them or worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Because if you do, I will do you harm. People knew that there was only one God and they were to worship him alone in that culture because God had revealed that through his word. And yet we see in this event that Jesus was receiving worship from people. So, so we have sort of a, a dilemma. We have some, a natural conclusion because they were calling him king. They were calling him Hosanna, the one who saves the son of David the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You see, in verse 38, if you look at your Bibles, it says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the crowd was shouting some other praises as well. If you look at the text, and this is what I love, even in your walk with the Lord, you could read this verse or this book of the Bible, and then you go to this book of the Bible, and you're like, ooh, paint me another picture of God's character. Oh, look at that. It reveals more. If you go to other gospels, like Matthew chapter 29, verse, or 21, verse 9, it says, the crowds, they went before him, speaking of Jesus, and they followed him, and they were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You may know that song. Mark says this in chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. And those who went before him and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. That messianic promise in our father and there's Jesus who is Lord and king. But if there's a king, there's a kingdom. See, the problem with our culture right now is they want the kingdom but no king. And Jesus is this king they're declaring. He's Hosanna in the highest, it says. The Lord of lords, the king of kings. John puts his little, little twist to it. He says, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, one commentator said this. When people shouted Hosanna, they were hailing Christ as king. 
The word actually means save now. And though in their minds they waited for an earthly king, God had a different way in mind of bringing the true salvation to all who would trust this king. You probably experienced this, right? You thought it was this way, but God said it's going to be this way. And he says, trust. And so they were thinking in the carnal, in the flesh, but Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate, you have no authority over me. So we're going to study this week. And so the people were crying out this mess- messianic psalm, proclaiming Jesus was the Savior of the Lord. This is from Psalm 118. Verse 26 says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice how these people being filled with the word was leaning to worship. If you want to worship Jesus, you need to be filled with the word and know his will. Whether the people realize this or not, Jesus, he understood the significance of this. He was a man of the word. The Bible says he's the living word because this would be the first time he would publicly ever receive worship. Publicly. He was no dummy. He said, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. But have you ever noticed Jesus when he heals people or does some crazy miracles in the gospel? He's like, shh, don't say anything. What? You remember that blind man in John? John chapter 9, he heals him, starts worship, and he's like, nah, don't, don't shh, keep, keep chill, bro. Just, okay? He would disciple his disciples. They're, 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 they want to just blaze forward. They are ready for this. They've seen the miracles. They've seen all this different stuff. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, in those days, uh, there was this great storm. He healed the boat, said just, you know, calm the sea. That's another messianic prophecy that only God could calm the seas. Jesus does it in a moment. And they realize, truly, you're the son of God. And he doesn't correct them. In fact, the apostle Peter, which we would say the first amongst equal, this leader of leaders would actually say and confess that Jesus is Lord because he would even ask his disciples, well, well who do you think I am? Because, you know, well, some say Jeremiah and some say Elijah and some say even John the Baptist. And Peter would say, well, you're Christ. You're the words of eternal life. You're, you're the son of God. You're, you're my savior. You're your Lord. You're the king. We, we, under, we recognize. And notice Jesus' response to Peter in that moment. Because everyone gets that revelation and focuses on that. But notice Jesus' heart. He answered Peter and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. It later goes on and says, He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. It's a little bizarre that he knew it, people were recognizing it, but he never let that happen publicly until Palm Sunday. And there's a reason why. But he received worship, which means Jesus received worship as God, as Lord, as Messiah, as King, throughout his ministry. In fact, We would hear Jesus say, well, now is not my time. Now is not my time. Now is not my time. In this holy week, this passion week, he's going to be saying, now is my time. Now is the time. And before I I die and I rise again, I want you to know I want to institute. There's a new covenant of grace. I want you to know that I'm serving you and the, the love that I have for you because I don't want you to just do a whole bunch of mission and stuff. You're going to love because I first loved you and I'm going to demonstrate that love on the cross, but I'm going to rise again and I'm going to fill you with my spirit, and it's going to be amazing. John chapter 2, 24, my time has not come. John chapter 7, 30, my time has not come. John chapter 8, verse 20, my time has not come. He's doing miracles. He's teaching the word. His time had not come. There is something significant in timing. You know that as a Christian. It's not a matter of is it good or is it bad, but is it God's timing? God has a plan and he wants to reveal that plan and he do, does this in certain ways so that our minds would be blown. He does it biblically, what we would call prophecy. Now, prophecy strengthens and confirms our faith. It proves to us that God is only God and we are not. He knows the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, and he does things to speak and then throughout history fulfills them. 
I have the words on the screen here, but you might want to jot this down. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 7 through 8. The prophet speaks. Now, I love the Old Testament and the prophets because it's like literally, thus does the Lord, and then they quote it. So they don't, this is God speaks. It's like, I wonder what that means. Just read it, bro. <laughs> Y'all too confused about what it means to just read the Bible. Get up in it and let God speak to you. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I have appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come. He's challenging. Oh, you guys want to, want to worship all these idols? Well, who's like me? There is no other God. Let them declare what's going to happen to fulfill it. Can they do that? Because guess what? I can. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? The answer is no. There is no rock. I know not any, God says. He is the foundation. And so he, he proves that he is God. He's receiving worship on the day. And now Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. You know what's beautiful about the resurrection? It's the proof. It's that receipt. Jesus manifested love on the cross. You don't have to bank it, but the reality is our living hope, the resurrection, being sealed with the spirit. These are all things for us. God could do whatever he wants. He could just perform a miracle, but he's going to be in his loving kindness, gracious to us to say it years before it happens. So that way we would get the idea of who God is. That's his love. And this is what he does through prophecy, a declaration of his word. So we would know he is God. God wanted us all to know that Jesus was God and king. Even before he came, there's going to be a Messiah, Micah 6, 8, coming in Bethany or Bethlehem. There's going to be this, 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 and this all lining up. So when it happens, you'll know. And you even see Jesus moving the prophetic here. I mean, you have to stop and think about the story. It's sort of crazy. I alluded to it and joked around a little bit. But look at verse 31. It says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Speaking of the colt, you shall say this. The Lord has need of it. Matthew 21, 4 tells us this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt. And a fowl of a beast, a burden. This prophecy is from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Of course, before Jesus was even alive, or so people thought. He's always been alive. He just had to be born. And so he knew, as a living word, what was to come. And he told his disciples, just go get that donkey. I already know it's never been written. It's per this is why this thing was made. I don't think there's anything better than what God has called you to do. And when you know why you've been made, it is incredible and powerful. Jesus knew this day was important to be fulfilled, to fulfill prophecy, to ride on that donkey. He even guarded that he wouldn't receive praise until doing it in the way that the father wanted it done. It says right after this, it took place in John chapter 11. Jesus starts saying, now my time has come. Listen to this. And Jesus answered them, the hour now has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus knew his purpose and knew the plan he knew the hour had come to die on the cross, to bear the sin and weight of the world, our shame, because he lived a perfect life, family. He had no sin, but he bore that sin for us on the cross. The Bible says he was our propitiation, meaning God was appeased to pour the wrath of God and our weight and our sin on Jesus. And we see that as he agonizes and say, Lord, is there any other way? And he deals with this emotion, this pain, and he knows his significance, but everyone doesn't. The disciples didn't know the significance. And you and I as a disciple won't know the significance sometimes when he asks us to do something. 
but our role is to obey and to trust. And now Jesus is proclaiming to everyone that he was the king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the king of Israel, God in flesh, the one to save. And this is why in verse 39 and 40, the Pharisees in the crowd say to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because people are wilding out. They're going crazy. They're worshiping him and blessing him as Lord. And he does not rebuke them. He encourages worship. Y'all need to come here and worship the Lord. He delights and inhabits the praises of his people. He answered them in verse 40. I tell you, if these were silent, speaking of the crowds, he doesn't need us at all. He invites us. The very stones would cry out. He said this because he knew prophecy and he was living, fulfilling the plans and purpose of God. Now, any mathematicians out there? Any scientific freaks? There we go. God bless you. One of you. Okay. One, you, you, you a little bit. You get, okay. We about to go deep, Pastor Bobby. Me and you. If y'all want to zone out in the next five minutes, that's good. Watching online, get a piece of paper, a pad, pen. You may want to take notes. Y'all, hey, just enjoy this, okay? Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Because I want you to see something in this text, in that verse 40, which is so significant and a prophecy fulfilled. Forgive me if I get a little geeky on you with some numbers. Math was my favorite. You know English? That's not my thing. I know I do it for a living, but come on. This is anointed of God, all right? Talk to me regular. You know I can't spell word nothing. It's awful. I loved math. It was simple because two plus two equals four. Two times two equals four. It's just clean. It's easy. Yay or nay, you got the right answer. How do you spell there? I don't know the difference between E-I and E-R. Okay? Why are you getting me confused? Why we got to have all these answers? Dude, give me the black and the white. It's easy. This is so easy that God is going to line up all my scientists, all my mathematicians, all the people that need this proof. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 25 is this great prophecy. Daniel is in the midst of praying to the Lord, and the angel appears to him and even reveals, this is not for your time. Just put it in the book, write it down, pray on it, move on. Right? Because sometimes God can give you revelation, but it doesn't mean everyone needs to know the revelation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 25, 70 weeks are decreed that your people... And your holy city, speaking of the Daniel, so the Israelites, the Jewish people, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Now, therefore, because of this, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, There shall be seven weeks. Then, 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. Raise your hand if y'all know what what the world he's talking about. Two people. Hey, I'm with the crowd over here. I'm like, what in the world is this? You ever read prophecy and people are like, it's so exciting. Look, and this is the picture of this and water means grace and eight. And I'm like, can you just tell me Jesus loves me again, please? Like, give me the simple verse. Ain't no one, no one knows what you're talking about. But this is why we don't just read, but we study. Right? This is why we're taking time as our part of our worship, to study with our minds, to understand things. In the Hebrew, weeks simply refers to a unit of seven. Or time, some translations say, probably in the NIV. The Hebrew word here often is meant for a unit of sevens. But it also must be a unit of seven years. For example, let's not be confusing. What, how many years is in a decade? Great job. <laughs> how many uh, donuts are in a dozen? You knew that way quicker. Okay? Century 100, this is all it's saying, okay? If you know the Hebrew, I don't want to give you the agreement. Put, I'm putting it on the, co- the cookie shelf for you right here. There are seven sevens. Seven D times seven is 490. Just throwing that out there for you. People on the internet, they're writing it down for you. Go to the chat later on. 
It's broken down with seven sevens, 62 sevens, and one seven, which is weird and awkward and bizarre. Bro, why you even got to confuse math like this? But they're broken into parts of the first of the coming of Messiah and then the second coming of the Messiah. 69 weeks or times, 69 times 7 is 483. Y'all fact check me later. I know you do it anyway on your phone when I'm talking, all right? The Messiah will come the first time. The last week, seven years, the Messiah will come a second time what we know in Bible scripture as the great tribulation. Gabriel here reveals to Daniel a starting point of these 70 week prophecies. There would be a command, it says, to build and restore Jerusalem. Well, I know about that because we're talking about building the wall. We, we're talking about the history and how, and how Nehemiah and God gave this vision and Nehemiah is just doing the work and doing the work. But he doesn't know even the work and the great work he's doing. Because there was this king, King Artaxerxes, and he made a decree giving Nehemiah permission, safe passage, supplies, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, to build the wall and to build the city in the month of Nisan. I don't even know what month that is. That's the Jewish calendar. I don't speak no Hebrew. But we study... And we find out that was March 5th, 444 BC. I told y'all I'm going to get geeky on you. I'm going to give you those hard details so you can see the great God. Can you guess how many years it took to restore the city? We know in Nehemiah it was a great miracle, 52 days. God had to build the wall before he built the temple to build the house of God and get the word out. Sometimes people can't just receive the word. You got to go and build their lives and help practically first john says how can you say be warm and be filled and turn your back and not give them bread so the balls the balls rolling the walls being built but did you know in the old testament the temple would be restored in exactly 49 years from king archaxerxes giving that order to nehemiah seven times seven is what 49 years that's interesting coincidence no, because Gabriel's message goes on and he says, but there are 69 units. There's a seven and then there's another block, 62. 69 total would pass from that time, from Nehemiah 2, that the appearance of the Christ, the Messiah, the prince would come and this prince would come, a savior, a great ruler, a Messiah, the king of righteousness. Now you need to understand Commentary David Guzik said, in our minds, a prince is a good step lower than a king. But in the Hebrew vernacular, or they would say a prince has more of the idea of a strong and mighty ruler. So when they're saying the prince of peace, oh, that's so cute. Look at that. But no, they're saying he brought peace because he's a great commander. There was chaos and he has enough strength to bring the comfort and the peace, to bring things in order. 69 weeks, 7 plus 62, 483 years. Are you following me? There would be a Messiah, a warrior, a king, a strong and mighty powerful prince to have victory, to overcome something. I don't know if you notice this, but the greatest enemy you have is sin. Sin gives us death. And the Bible says Jesus overcame sin. Death, where is your sting? And squashed the enemy publicly, displayed it. Well, when you do the math, hopefully you're getting there. I'm trying to go so slow. Robin Anderson's book in The Coming Prince follows this argument in great detail. Just for all my nitpicky people that don't believe in prophecy or God knows he's sovereign and all this different stuff. He says, if you use the Israel calendar which we have a different calendar. That's why Passover and Easter is always jacked up and no one knows why, right? Because we do 365 days, they do 360 days. That's why they have the month of Nisan and all these other months. He says, you can calculate it. And by the way, he's a mathematician. Good on him. I'll rely on his resource. 
173,880 days from the decree to Nehemiah with King Archaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 2 of what we're studying to do this great work was the exact day of the triumphal entry fulfilling prophecy to the day. To the day. Y'all ain't going to worship me. God already got this. These rocks are going to cry out. This is the time. This is why I came. This is my purpose. I'm going to plan this out. And I'm going to fulfill. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The character of the Lord. You know, when you obey God, you reveal his character. He is obeying God and loving people to the end. And he's coming in the name of God. For Galatians 4, 4 says it was a time and a purpose appointed, the specific time that he would come and do this right then. So I believe Jesus knew specifically about this prophecy. He received praise as king. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. This was from the same psalm in Psalm 118, verse 22 through 26. We have another prophecy. The stone that the builders rejected has come, become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. Tim at work. It is marvelous in our eyes. He knew about it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, you can rejoice and have joy when you focus on God and what he is doing and not the outside circumstance. Save us, we pray, O Lord. That word, save us, we pray, O Lord, could be translated, Hosanna. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. We as Christians should come and know our anointed king and always have a posture to bless the Lord when we come in this place. One commentator said, there was only one occasion in our Lord's earthly ministry on which he depicted as presenting himself openly as Zion's king, the so-called triumphal entry, recorded in each one of the Gospels and fulfilling Zechariah 9.9 and Psalm 118.26. Now, why is this so important? Because Jesus is God and he receives worship. He fulfills prophecy, proving he's God. But listen, it shows us Jesus gives peace. This mighty king, this warrior, you remember there was... Another seven. Revelation 19 says he's coming and riding and coming back for us on a white horse. And he will bring all things back together. Shalom. He's going to make every wrong right. He is, you're going to, he's going to judge the living and the dead. He is a mighty warrior. His name is the Lord, the Bible says. But in this season, in this day, in this moment right now, we don't see him coming on a horse, he came on a donkey, a colt. You see, Jesus came to save us from the sin, to restore, to redeem, to bring life. He's showing God's character because he's doing his will and he's showing us the love of God. For this is who Jesus is, love. God didn't just leave us in our sin and say, well, good luck with your iniquities. The wage of sin is death, tough luck. But while we were sinners, he loved us. When Jesus came to the earth in heaven, do you remember that? All the angels in heaven rejoiced. And they still rejoice knowing the plan of God and seeing this worked out through man and salvation. In Luke chapter 2, verses 3 through 14, another holiday we celebrate, Christmas. And suddenly there was with the angel of the multitude, the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Jesus came riding on a donkey, which is a sign of peace, not war and not judgment. Jesus will come back again, but first, in this first coming, before the end of the age, he comes as a servant king to bring peace. Not what people would expect. Forgiveness, mercy, love. Forgiveness, mercy, and love. Paul would say, he who knew no sin became sin for us, That we might become the righteousness of God. And we're to herald this this good news. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says, all of this is from God. 
who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave now us a ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them and trusting us the message of reconciliation. You may remember Jesus' famous words in John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But if you read the text, Jesus goes on and says, now for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that they might be saved through him. Now, whoever in him, man, believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. He's prepping his disciples on the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. You go out there. This is a moment, but let that moment mark your life and stamp you to go tell others. And so too with us. We need to be crying out Hosanna more. We need to be people of confession, knowing that God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. He comes with peace and rain, and he can take your chaos and the mess of your sin and restore you and redeem you and forgive you, for he is just and faithful. He'll forgive you all of your sins. Jesus, save us now, we should be crying. For today is the day of salvation, the time is now. Jesus came, it's appointed for man to live once and then be judged. And if you don't have Jesus, then you are judged in your sin. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is saying no to Jesus for the whole role of the Spirit of God is to point you to Jesus as the Messiah, as the King. If you try to get your life in order and get peace, you will never, never have it. But unless the seed dies, unless it dies, it won't have any fruit. When are you going to die to yourself? Christian, disciple, when are you going to die to yourself? I know you want a fruitful life. I know you want an abundant life. But when are you going to trust? When are you going to give over? When are you going to surrender? When are you going to confess? When are you going to cry Hosanna? This is the day. And if you don't do it, all of the world is going to do it. Rocks will cry out. This church is going to do it. I'm going to do it. People are doing it and finding freedom in Jesus. Chains broken, redemption, restoration, love, store, all these things. But you have to cry out. And Jesus said he will cast no one away. And he wants us, the church today, to cry out, Hosanna. We need to have boldness that Jesus is our mighty king, not a political party or person, okay? Not none of this, your job and money in the bank. Jesus can bring that peace and the comfort that you only need in your trouble and affliction. He says he can bless you and give you comfort so you can now be ministers to others and give comfort. Jesus, God himself came because he wants a relationship and he redeemed you with his blood. Jesus is God, y'all. And he wants you to know it. The question is, will you worship? And will you go herald his good news? Because Jesus didn't rebuke these people for saying Hosanna and their praise. He received it. Because he's God. You're not. And he proves and he will prove that he is God in your life as you trust him. With your finances. With your children. With your needs. So you want some peace? You want some shalom? You want abundant life? Come to Jesus. For today is a day of salvation. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much. We say hallelujah, hosanna, king of kings, lord of lords, mighty warrior. God, you deserve all of our praise. We thank you, God, for this season. We thank you even right now, the posture of our heart. Woo, how pumped we are for the resurrection. But Lord, I pray for death now. I pray for surrender. I pray for faith. I pray for those watching and even in the room, if they don't know you, God, that you would bring salvation. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and was raised from the dead, you will be saved. 
And we want to make sure that you know and you don't walk out those rooms without knowing Jesus and you can be saved. And if that is you, you cry out to the Holy Spirit. You cry out to God, the living King, and he will give you peace. He will give you salvation. He will give you new life. He will make all things new and to come and you will have a hope that no one could take away. When you are in the Father's hands, no one can snatch you away. But you must come. You must receive. You must believe in his name. For if not, you are condemned. Jesus died for sin. Hell is real. But heaven is as well. Lord, we thank you for heaven. We thank you for Pastor Daryl being with you right now. For when we die, we're in your presence. Lord, we bless your name and we thank you, God. If there's any in the room that needs salvation, as we're praying, I want to give you an opportunity. And as we're praying, if that's you, you just raise your hand, not for anyone else, but just to acknowledge me because I want to lead you in a prayer. This is your moment. This is your time. And I'll say the prayer regardless because I know there's maybe people watching online. They need the Lord as well. But there will be times, and you're going to see this, that people need to move in faith and make a public profession of faith. We're going to be having a baptism soon. This is what it is. It's the eternal work. And so we want to start in the house of God, repenting and asking for salvation. And so listen, if that is you and you're here in this soft moment, this is your time. I want you to pray this. Jesus, I believe you are God. I come and worship you with my life. Jesus, I ask that you would save me of my sin. Give me new life. Thank you for your love. And feel your love in my heart. Holy Spirit, empower me and fill me. Help me to know my purpose. God, stretch me and grow me and mature me. I need you, Jesus. The Bible says that when you call out to God in a prayer like that, in a posture of humility, he pours grace on those that are humble but opposed to the proud. And that is the way of the Christian walk. We continue to walk from glory to glory, but before glory comes, there is death. There's a smile I can imagine on Jesus' face when he's receiving worship as he's going to the cross in Jerusalem because he knows his bride is going to be sanctified and there is a new kingdom coming. So he's going to go to the cross and we're going to study it this week and then we're going to celebrate on Easter that there is glory. Man. Man, bless you guys. I'm going to have Pastor Bobby come on up and just close us out with the last announcement.